when we come to the lord's table the important thing is to have a right attitude towards the lord and towards one another so in matthew 26 we read the first time jesus was sitting at that last supper with his disciples in verse 20 and as they were eating matthew 26 and verse 21 he said truly i say to you that one of you will betray me and supposing the lord were here today and at this lord's table he says one of you is going to betray me in the next few days would you ever think it was yourself or would you say yeah i think i know who that is <laughs> and you got your mind on somebody else and that is the area where with all the weaknesses those 11 disciples had here we see one good quality in them which where they probably surpass us even though we are born again they said in verse 22 is it i lord and that's a question we need to ask ourselves that if the lord were to hear today say one of you is going to betray me how many of you would honestly say lord is it i or would immediately our mind will come to somebody i think is yeah i they look around and say i know who that's going to be and i would say that attitude is what prevents you from growing spiritually. And I believe that in these years that you've been a believer, you could have grown a lot more spiritually if your attitude had been is it me lord. But our, the devil is always very quick to tell us that can't be you, it must be that other person there. what do you gain by thinking it could be another person we gain a lot if we say lord is it me we gain nothing by thinking we are so shrewd that we know who it is going to be so that's the first thing i want to mention and it's interesting even judas he was such a clever guy he had to sound the same as the others and even though he was the crook He said, "Lord, is it me, Rabbi? Not me, Lord." And the Lord said, "It is you." Verse twenty-five. The other thing I want to mention is uh, he gave us a great example in John chapter thirteen at the Last Supper. In John 13 it was the last supper he it's very interesting the you know you know that he washed his disciples feet but listen to the introduction that the holy spirit gives to his washing the disciples feet John 13:3 Jesus knowing that everything in the universe was given by the father into his hand and he knew very well i have come from god i'm going back to god the next sentence is he puts a towel and starts washing people's feet now that's such a contrast it's a anti climax almost everything is in my hands the whole universe is in my hands i came from god and going back to god so what am i going to do wash people's feet that is the exact opposite of the spirit in the world is so that's the other thing because jesus said verse 13 you call me teacher and lord and you are right i am that if i the lord and teacher washed your feet you must also wash one another's feet 
because I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Because if, I, if you call me your master, verse 16, a servant is not greater than his master. And I sent you, you're not greater than the one, you're being sent, you're not greater than the one who's sending you. And then is a word that we need to hear frequently. When you hear something like this, we say, yeah, yeah, I know that. Verse 17, if you really know it, you'll be blessed if you do it. What does it mean in practical terms to wash one another's feet? It's not a question of taking off our shoes and socks and like the Pope does as a ritual. And there are some others also imitate that. It's not a ritual. I understand it like this. You know, in those days, in every house, rich man's house, whenever anybody was invited for dinner, there'd always be a bucket of water at the door and a slave who would come and wash everybody's feet. Now, because Jesus had said to this rich man, I want to use your upper room, but I don't want anybody hanging around there. That's why he did not appoint a slave there. Otherwise, he'd have with the, he kept the bucket of water, but he didn't keep a slave. Because Jesus told him, I don't want anybody else in that room. And so, it's the job of a slave that Jesus did. And he was not... And that remember, that's the last day of his earthly ministry. When you think of many Christian leaders, in the last day of their life, they are some director or chairman or some big title, a great honored position. And that shows how far Christendom has drifted from the teaching of Jesus. I told you how Christendom has drifted with this salar salaried pastors and people writing uh, letters re reporting about their work in order to get money. Christendom has drifted so far away and one of the things we seek to do in CFC is in every area to come right back. Even this business of titles, Jesus specifically told them, don't be called rabbi or today don't be called pastor, don't be called reverend. Who obeys it? People say, who cares for that? We follow what other Christians do, not what Jesus said. That's what they're saying. Okay. Well, in CFC, we don't follow what other Christians do. We don't follow what other churches do. We're not here to judge them, let them go their way. But we will seek to follow the Lord. We will not take titles. We are supposed to be brothers till the end of our life. And we will do any lowly job for one another, whoever we are. We must always have that attitude. There's nobody who is senior or junior in our church. And that is what we are testifying. You don't get a bigger slice of bread or a smaller slice of bread than anybody else. And there's an equality when it comes to the breaking of bread. And that must not be a ritual. We must say, Lord, I, I consider myself less than the least of all the saints and I'm called here to serve others just like Jesus was. So there's no, I'm not saying that we are not willing to do lowly jobs. We're all willing to clean the floor and move the chairs and all that. I'm sure all of us are willing to do that. It's not so much in that. It's so much in, it's much more in an attitude we have towards others. We can do all these things on outwardly show that we are servants, but if my attitude to others at home is to criticize them, you know, to go home and then speak evil of some brother or sister in the church and judge them, we're not acting according to the spirit of Jesus who washed people's feet. If there was dirt on the feet, Jesus didn't criticize it, he washed it. So that's what I learned from here, that when we come to the Lord's table, 
If I see dirt in somebody else's life, I want to wash it off, not point a finger and say, look at him, look at her. So may God help us to take part in the right spirit. I also want to turn to 1 Corinthians in chapter 10. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, <clears throat> it says in verse 17, since there is one bread, see the bit of bread that we eat is actually part of one, originally one bread, and that is saying we are one, we partake of the one bread showing that we are one body. And if in your heart there is any feeling of superiority to anybody else here because of your education, <clears throat> or your culture, or your race, or any stupid thing like that, I would recommend that you do not break bread today and say, Lord, I want to judge myself, get rid of that habit before I break bread again. I must consider myself as in every single way equal to everybody sitting here. That I do not have the slightest opinion that I am superior in any way, that I look down on anyone here, I'm unfit to break bread. Because we who are many are one body. You are not getting a bigger slice of bread than anybody else. Remember that other person who you think is inferior to you is getting the same slice of bread as you are. And we who are many are one body. So that is also so missing in Christendom today. So we can have all the right doctrines about grace being something that helps us to overcome sin. And we believe in victory over sin and that Christ came in the flesh and all these wonderful things. But if the practical result of it is that we don't take a low position and stop judging others and judge ourselves and that we don't get offended with any word that we hear in the church but accept correction from anyone, not just from an elder brother, and something is wrong with us. So there are many areas, it says, in relation to the breaking of bread, one Corinthians, the next chapter, 1 Corinthians 11, before breaking bread and drinking the cup, it says in verse 28, 1 Corinthians 11, 28, everybody must examine themselves. Let a man or a woman examine himself, herself, and thus eat the bread and drink the cup. Now, if you don't do that, then you're drink. If you don't judge yourself, then you're drinking and eating judgment to yourself. It says. But if I judge myself, verse thirty-one, we will not be judged. I thought of this in relation to what it says in verse thirty. Because you don't judge yourselves, many among you are weak and sick and a number even die. Boy, it must have been pretty bad in Corinth that some people died because they didn't break bread with the right spirit. So we mustn't take that lightly. Let a man examine himself, nobody else, verse 28, and thus eat the bread and drink the cup. This communion has become such a ritual in most of Christendom. There are people sometimes I remember in Bangalore who would never come for the meetings regularly, but would come for breaking of bread, thinking there's some, like in the Hindu temples, that they call that a special thing they give there, and that that will bring them in some touch with God. So some stupid idea like that. There are Christians who have that idea. They come for breaking of bread, thinking thinking I'll get some blessing out of this. I'll tell you what, you get a curse. It says here, you eat bread and eat without judging yourself. You will be judged yourself. So it's a very serious thing to break bread without judging ourselves. Now, in the early days, when I was a young Christian and I used to go to some church, they never taught me this. It was just, oh, breaking of bread. Some churches I used to go to, every Sunday they had breaking of bread. And they lived in such carnality and judging themselves, ju or rather judging others, that I never, never realized that these things were serious. 
till I began to study the scriptures more seriously. And after we started CFC, we took breaking of bread very seriously. And I remember in Bangalore, once for six months, we had no breaking of bread. I said, there are things wrong here, which are not set right. So we all need to stop breaking bread for six months. That wakes people up. Why are we not breaking bread for six months? So all I say is don't take this as a ritual that we have in a routine way. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's the breaking of bread Sunday, so we take part. Let's take every, every single day that we break bread. Let's take it seriously to judge ourselves. Because then the promise is, if we judge ourselves, verse 31, we will not be judged. And it's like a reminder. In the early days, they, you know, in the early days, they not only broke bread every Sunday. In Acts chapter 2, they broke bread every day. But then they must have been judging themselves. So I find, I take that verse as very, I've taken it for many, many years, 1 Corinthians 11, 31. Say, Lord, I take that for the, my final judgment when I stand before the Lord. I believe I will not be judged for anything because I tried to judge myself rightly in every situation. Whatever people may have thought about me makes no difference. In that day, the Lord who examines me will say, no judgment. That's what we should aim for. And that can happen to every one of us if we judge ourselves rightly. And the breaking of bread is an opportunity to do that. Amen.